my presentation is titled turning weather forecasts into flood warnings that lead to action and i think a lot of the, the topics that i want to discuss um have already been kind of mentioned in the previous presentation so hopefully that's a neat way to join together and i've set the context here again with these floods we experienced we saw um, across europe this summer and as sean already said i mean these floods seem to catch people by surprise and as a scientist it's it's quite difficult to comprehend that because clearly um, a kind of event on this scale was something that was possible within the climate models. We know that these events are getting more extreme and we would see large scale events like this happen. And as Sean's already pointed out, this, the event was picked up by the forecasts a few days in advance. So there should have been time for people to be prepared for them. And uh, myself and many other people working in the field have been, I think, quite aghast by these events that people were still in their, in their houses when the flood water started to rise around them. Um, we've got a colleague at the University of Reading whose parents' house was flooded and hearing his first hand, hand experiences of this has been quite interesting. So there's clearly an uh, important message here that our, though our science is really good, there's something going wrong um, with the way the flood warning systems work. Uh, we've seemed to have lost your audio, I think. Uh, Linda. Am I back? You are back. <clears throat> Don't know what's going on here. Okay, so some of the headlines coming out of this event really highlighted the challenge, I think. Um, and throughout my career in hydrology, it's been quite interesting that it often takes a big event to highlight the need for change. So though it's devastating that, you know, these events happen and clearly people lose their lives and livelihoods through them, um, it's interesting how they shape the face of hydrology as we know it. So I'm going to talk a little bit more today about really how innovation in flood forecasting and warning can help improve resilience to increasing flood risk. And that's something that clearly we need as we face a, a changing climatic future. These events are going to become more likely. Uh, we can't clearly build flood defences everywhere to protect against them. So one of the things we can do is improve resilience. And Flood forecasting and warning has to be uh, a part of a broader, a broader set of flood risk management options. Next slide, please, Chris. So one of the key innovations I think that's happened in flood forecasting and warning in recent years is this idea that um, a warning system isn't just a combination of weather forecasts and hydrological modelling. Uh, we're quite good at those bits and Sean's already highlighted some of the um, improvements in our weather forecasting ability and there's been similar improvements in our ability to you know forecast what happens to the water once it gets into the river system but around the outside of that there's also um, a need to appreciate that those things don't happen in isolation weather forecast and hydrological modeling are dependent on observations and then if we want to have forecasts that actually lead to action, we need to think in advance what information is needed to support action. What do we expect people to do when they receive these flood warnings? And only when we understand that can we then um, make forecasting models that can address those needs. So there's a clearly a need for communication all the way up and down this chain to understand what people are going to do with the information and to understand how uncertainties and limitations propagate through the chain. So Sean was talking there about um, ensemble forecasting. So that's certainly something that's um, increased, increased in prevalence over recent years, but it comes with a communication challenge. How do you communicate to people this idea that, you know, something might happen and it might have really big impacts, but, you know, also there might be a much smaller event um, and how does that affect their decision making and their action? So a lot of the work that I've been doing over recent years has been looking at this idea of an end to end flood warning chain and how all these different bits fit together. Next slide, please, Chris. So I've put a little summary here of my career history. Um, again, I think it's helpful to, to walk through this just so you can get an appreciation of, of where I'm coming from and what experience I've had to lead me to, to you know, put together this presentation. So I started as a geographer at the University of Bristol. I then went on to do um, an MSc in Sustainable Management of the Water Environment at the University of Newcastle. Like Sean, I never intended necessarily to be a hydrologist. Although I have to say my, my father and my grandfather were in kind of water based careers. So I did spend many days as a child and visiting sewage treatment works and reservoirs and these kind of things. So maybe it was inbuilt in me, but it was opportunity in the end that um, led me to go down this career path. So when I finished my MSc at the University of Newcastle, 
I did have an inkling that um, I did think I perhaps wanted to do more research and stay in academia. But I also knew that I didn't want to do research for the sake of research. Um, I wanted to make sure that any work that I did was kind of grounded in an operational need. So I moved to the um, JBA consultancy and did a couple of years of flood risk management consultancy. And that gave me a really good grounding in um, the breadth of issues in flood risk management. You know, so everything from um, development, flood forecasting and warning, data, mapping, kind of really good grounding. Um, and then after that, I moved back to the University of Newcastle and did a PhD. The PhD that I did was um, funded by an insurance company. So again, it had a direct operational focus. The question here was um, improving the understanding of the flood risk models that are used by the insurance company. So that took us up to 2013. Um, after, well, kind of before I finished my PhD, but a bit of crossover at the end, I moved up to the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and worked as part of the Scottish Flood Forecasting Service. Now, interesting side note here, um, that wasn't necessarily the career path that I would have thought I would take after finishing my PhD. However, uh, my husband's in the military and he moves around a lot. So you can see there's quite a lot of job moves on this um, career path. But actually, although at the time that might have seemed like something that I wasn't having full choice in what I was doing, um, you'll see by the end of my presentation, I think that's added really real value and breadth to my career and added uh, extra skill sets that I think are valuable as we face um, a climate change future. So I'll talk a little bit more about my work at um, CPAN in a few minutes. And then again, we had another move, um, moved down to rural Lincolnshire, where it turned out there wasn't really a lot of work to do. Um, so I ended up having a bit of a career break here, had some maternity leave, had some children, um, and now I work at the University of Reading. I've been involved in two projects at the University of Reading. One of them looking at um, flooding from intense rainfall. So this idea that um, when we have really heavy intense rainfall events, there's actually a lot more uncertainty around those. So how does that end-to-end -end forecasting chain work for those kind of rainfall events? And the projects I'm currently working on, um, it's called the Fathom Project. It's looking at how we can use um, flood forecast to support humanitarian action. So, you know, taking the skills that we are quite good at in the UK really, and how can we apply those and uh, develop forecasting ability for other areas of the world. And then um, just to say that I'm only be at the University of Reading for another few weeks, and then I'm moving to the University of Oxford. Um, so onwards and upwards, I think, we'll see what happens. Next slide, please, Chris. So we started off with the German floods, which, has, as I said, uh, I think have opened an opportunity to have a conversation about the effectiveness of flood forecasting and warning. But actually, the big flood event that shaped my own career, although I probably didn't realise it at the time, was the uh, floods we experienced in the UK in 2007. So there was two events here. There was a, a June event, a July event. Uh, during the June event, I was stuck on a traffic jam trying to get the head office of uh, JBA in Skipton, watching people be picked off uh, roofs in Sheffield by helicopter. And then by the following the July event, um, I was walking around rivers in the Midlands uh, doing a post-event survey, so trying to understand where the flood water got to. And actually during that experience, um, I got to speak to people who had been flooded by those events and similar to Sean, really to start to understand the impact this kind of um, flooding has on people's lives. So following the pit review, there was um, a, following the floods, there was a big review by uh, Sir Michael Pitt that came up with a number of recommendations, many of which I could have put in here, but I've highlighted two, which I think have really shaped uh, where my career path has gone. One of which was the Environment Agency and the Met Office should work together for a joint warning centre. And the other ones was that we should issue warnings against the lower probability to increase the preparation and lead time for emergency responders. Next slide, please, Chris. So what this led to was the setup of the Flood Forecasting Centre in England and Wales and the Scottish Flood Forecasting Service in Scotland. Both of these organisations have recently you know, passed their 10 year birthdays. So there's a few uh, information online if you want to look about you know, what, what's been achieved through those. So here, this was a really innovative idea that um, the meteorologists and the hydrologists would work together directly and, and issue kind of flood forecasts with a one combined voice and combine the expertise um, in one place. Next slide, please, Chris. And they do this through the flood um, guidance statement. Oh, you've gone backwards. 
Next one. There we go. <laughs> Lewis River Flood Guidance Statement, which um, you can see an example of here. So we get a five day flood forecast uh, for different counties across the country. And this is based on both a likelihood of an event happening and the resulting impacts. So this was a big change when it first was introduced and um, started to talk about, you know, what's the probability of flooding causing, causing major impacts rather than just a flood happening. Um, and there's lots of science that I don't have time to go into now, which is supporting how we assess the likelihood and the impacts. And that's clearly something which we still need to work on. There's lots of opportunities for more research in those areas. But the key thing here is, um, again, around the communication challenge. So it's very easy to say um, from our data, we can see that there's a you know, low likelihood of significant flooding. So that would be box number four on this diagram. But how do we get people to pay attention to that and say, actually, you know, there could be significant impacts from this. So you need to start thinking about how you would prepare in advance. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with my own husband the other day who got home from work and said something like, oh, I had to take a detour because the road was flooded. And I said, well, there was a weather warning. And he says, yeah, it was only a yellow one. I don't pay any attention to them. And I thought, even if my own husband isn't paying attention to this, like, clearly there's a challenge here about communication, about how, how we make people aware that actually there is a, a chance, even if it's not um, a high one, that there will be significant impacts. Next slide, please, Chris. So Sean's already uh, come across this. I put this in to show that, you know, it's not just um, people who are making these innovation changes. Actually, the, our ability to do flood forecasting warning is relying on developments in science as well. So this paper that Sean already mentioned has shown that the skill of forecasting events has increased. So now you know, we've got um, today's six day forecast is as accurate as the five day forecast 10 years ago. And I think this is echoed across, you know, all different lead times. Next slide, please. So that's fine for river flooding. Um, I think we're really quite good at that. Uh, we can forecast events quite far in advance and we understand where the water's going to go in our catchment and you know where people are along the river system. Um, an area that we uh, have a lot of uncertainties around still is this idea of the area of surface water and flash flooding. So again, looking at the science, um, a paper here from 2016 was talking about a step change in rainfall forecasting saying that actually our ability to forecast these kind of convective events, so that's kind of heavy summer downpours, um, has really improved dramatically. And you can see the examples here, um, I've got the radar images on the left as you look at it, and on the right is the Met Office 1.5 kilometer scale uh, forecast model. You can see that looks quite realistic. Um, so, you know, you could think that was right. But then one of the challenges here is, is that although the forecast now looks realistic, there's still a lot of uncertainties around it. Um, our ability to be able to forecast these kind of events might actually be limited by, by the science itself. So one of the issues we have is that we know, we, although we know there'll be heavy rainfall event, we don't necessarily know exactly where it will be. And that's why you get the Met Office uh, weather warnings where you have uh, large yellow areas across the whole country saying that, yes, there will be some form of heavy rainfall event. We don't know exactly where it is. And how we deal with that from an operational viewpoint, um, if we think back to my first slide about the end-to-end -end forecast, how a decision maker is going to use that information when they perhaps want, ideally want to know in a bit more detail um, where flooding might occur. Next slide, please, Chris. So one of the projects that I was involved with um, at SEPA was trying to take that a bit further and say, OK, well, we have these forecasts. Um, the rainfall forecast is probably as good as we're going to get. So now how can we use that in practice? We need to go beyond saying, or oh, we, we can't do something because we can't pinpoint down exactly where, where, where the rainfall is going to be, because decision makers need to know something. So this was motivated by the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, clearly a big event for Scotland. Um, and Glasgow has a known history of flooding. So um, it was quite important that we needed to be prepared for if anything happened, we could get a warning out in advance. So this was the... Um, a uh, prototype system we developed, uh, which made the best use of existing flood risk maps and combined those with the Met Office um, ensemble based forecasts. And you can see here we produced uh, information on a grid based system, so at one kilometer grid, and combined that information with uh, impacts to say actually if it rains, where are we going to see the biggest impacts in the city? And then we produced a briefing uh, summary that was circulated to various stakeholders during the events. So this is a really good example of taking um, 
taking the available science and trying to be innovative and do something around it. But it did highlight the communication challenge around that um, and how, how we deal with those uncertainties and what they mean for decision makers. Next slide, please, Chris. So the final thing I wanted to talk about um, was the international aspect of this. So the work that I've talked about so far has been in the UK, but clearly flooding is not just an issue in the UK. Um, and the impacts are probably going to be much greater in other countries where they don't necessarily have the resources to uh, take proactive action uh, on the receipt of forecasts. So current work at the University of Reading through the Fathom project has been looking at um, building international partnerships and working on co-production to share knowledge and build capacity for uh, flood resilience across, across the world. Next slide, please, Chris. So one of the projects that we've been working on is um, producing emergency flood bulletins that have been shared with the UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, FCDO, during major events, uh, working with the, climate, the Red Cross Climate Centre, a number of other scientific organisations across the UK. Next slide, please, Chris. So this is an example of using the GLOFAST model, which Sean just mentioned here. So GLOFAST produces probabilistic flood forecasts uh, across the whole world. However, um, here the uncertainty isn't necessarily about surface water flood forecasting and the uncertainty of where the rainfall will be. Here we have a lot of uncertainties due to the fact that there's no observational data available to calibrate this model or to review our forecasts when they've been issued. So other issues there around communication. But what we've done here is combined the um, river flood forecast from GLOFAS with some population data and flood risk mapping from the University of Bristol and produced some flood hazard and impact um, reports that have been shared widely. Next slide, please. They've been really well received. Uh, various quotes from end users saying it's the first time they've been able to use science so early in both planning and responding to the devastating impacts of cyclones. So it's a really good example of taking the science that we've got and being proactive, working directly with decision makers and seeing how can we use the information we have to improve um, their ability to respond to these kind of events. We've done this for four different events now, and we've just produced a um, learning and recommendations report for FCDO. And one of the key things in there, uh, we're looking at recommendations of various different people in that end-to-end -end forecasting chain. But every time the number one recommendation really was more engagement, whether that's among sharing data, sharing models, sharing knowledge about uncertainty, sharing information about what the action is actually going to be taken, every time it brought down to more engagement. Next slide, please, Chris. So that was a bit of a whistle-stop summary, but um, going back to the, uh, the beginning, really, um, thinking back to those floods in Germany, and they have, I think, started a debate around how can we have more efficient early warning systems. So not, you know, I don't think if those floods have happened anywhere else, I think similar, similar uh, areas for improvement would have been found in the flood warning system. So my own opinion is that effective warning systems require good science and good communication. There's a diagram here from the High Weather Project, and they're calling it the, the valleys of death. So you can see the mountains there are the areas where we, we know quite a lot. That's the good science we have at each point. And then the bridges crossing those um, are supposed to show where information is lost as we move along that chain. So in my opinion, hydrologists need to work at the interface of science and practice to cross these bridges. Next slide, please, Chris. So I was thinking about all of this, about what this means for careers in hydrology and how um, we might want to think about how we can form our careers to be more effective against making, building resilience for the climate emergency. And I thought about my own career path, but it certainly wasn't straight. It was kind of meandering, but more than that, I think actually, uh, I think it, it was quite like a braided channel um, with various different uh, parts joining together along the way. Um, you can see this, just the, the first definition I got of a braided channel from um, the internet was that it's frequent left lateral shifts, often totally rearranged by large floods with no levees and no cohesive ramps. And that's what I think is important for um, future careers in hydrology, that we don't be confined by this idea of an academic career, an operational career or a career with a certain organisation, that we allow ourselves to be flexible, to seek opportunities to work with different groups of people, consider how to join up new developments in science communication and observation, and yet yeah, really value and um, varied career paths. So that's all I had to say. Thanks very much. Um, one sort of quick observation. It was interesting that both you 
and, and Sean were talking about, um, I suppose, living through the, the lived experience almost of, of floods, as in you know, within our lifetime, within our working co careers, both of you sort of picked up on that point and um, almost as a, I don't want to use the word incentive, but but almost as a, as a, a reason for, for gaining the interest for going in, into hydrology uh, and then using that as, as the, I suppose, as the springboard for uh, a career um, go, going through um, uh, the hydrology path. My question though, um, Linda, is um, what do you see in, in the next, say, 10 years or so? You picked on some really excellent points there, but what do you see as perhaps the, the, the next big developments in the space that you're working in? Uh, or perhaps I could phrase that as what would you like to see as the next sort of developments in the next 10 years? I think it is that we need innovation without having big events. We need people to realise that this is, um, you know, something that is affecting us now and will become worse in the future. So we can't just wait for events like 2007 or the events we had in Germany this year. We need to have build these relationships with all the stakeholders in that end-to-end -end forecasting chain and have these conversations. So when a flood event occurs, we're ready to take action in advance rather than going, oh, we really should be doing something more about this after the event. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's 